Good afternoon and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This afternoon, we're taking up S305 and amendments there too. And we are going to start by hearing from representatives from Rye Gate. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Bridget Morris with Morris Strategies. I'm here on behalf of my client, Rygate Associates. And I'm joined by Andy Bootin, who's from Pellergy, who is constructing a project that we're working on uh, at Rygate Biomass Plant. So I thought it would make sense to just start with an overview of the plant and the legislative timeline so you can understand why we're here today and what we're asking for. So uh, the Rygate Biomass Plant's been operational since 1993, produces 20 megawatts of baseload uh, power using selective catalytic reduction and emissions control, uh, produces 160,000 megawatt hours a year, and has 21 employees and an, a number of uh, interested parties who provide the, the biomass resources as well. Uh, produces $2 million a year in wages and benefits and distributes more than 4,000 tons of wood ash per year, uh, $350,000 annually to the state and municipal and state taxes, and uh, currently operates with a power purchase agreement price of 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, the renewable energy credits are shared 10% for Rygate Associates and 90% for Vermont Utilities. That's through the standard offer program, which in 2011 uh, was established by the legislature. And in 20, or 2012, the PUC set this PPA rate uh, for 10 years, which expired in 2022, the 10 cent a kilowatt hour rate um, at which the utilities have to purchase the power from Rygate. And then in 2011 or 2021, um, the legislature extended that for two years to November 1 of 2024, where it remains today, the current uh, PPA. Um, in 2022, the legislature then enacted Act 155, which we will get into here. Act 155 conditionally extended the PPA all the way out to 2032, but it was based on Rygate achieving an efficiency increase uh, by 50%. It also established a timeline for which uh, Rygate to achieve the efficiency improvements. And if they failed to meet the timeline, the PPA automatically goes away. So this is the timeline that Act 155 established. So by July 1 of last summer, the Rygate owners had to submit a contract for the construction of the efficiency piece and the engineering certification, which they did. And in October of the, the next deadline that they have to meet is actually uh, making sure that these main components have been constructed. And uh, if they fail to do that, then in November 1 of this year, that power purchase agreement goes away. In September of 2025, then the department would investigate Rygate and make a recommendation to the Public Utility Commission saying as whether or not Rygate's achieved the efficiency uh, increase that's been mandated. And if they make a positive uh, recommendation, then the Public Utility Commission starts a new rate case and determines a new rate for that period of November 1, 2026 to November 1 of 2032. So I'm gonna pass it over to Andy, who's gonna to talk to you about, uh, about what Rygate is doing to achieve that efficiency increase, and then we'll get into why we're here. Okay, again, Andy Boutin uh, with Pellergy. We're, we're a local uh, wood pellet boiler uh, importer, installer, uh, work in the renewable energy sector, heat pumps, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, as far as this project goes, we've been brought in as the uh, the wood pellet mill advisor. Um, we we ran a wood pellet mill for a couple of years uh, down in West Windsor, Vermont, uh, before it uh, its demise uh, due to engineering issues and other issues. But um, the overall concept to increase the plant's efficiency by fifty percent is to re reclaim heat uh, from the stack. Um, the, the the plant's low efficiency is due to sending so much of that heat up the stack. Uh, so per Act 155, getting that that efficiency upgrade 
uh, has been engineered using Wilson Engineering as well as um, uh, quite a few uh, engineers supplying the equipment itself. Um, we have civil engineering, air quality, noise study to, to meet the Act 250 requirements uh, and have selected, down-selected the contractor for the actual pelletizing equipment and the dryer equipment, which is Prodessa uh, as the facility con contractor here. Prodessa is an overseas organization. So, so the idea is to use this waste heat to dry wood chips. Um, this waste heat is very low quality heat. Um, and so it's a very specialized dryer system that has to be employed. Uh, it's, it, it'll be basically the first biomass power plant in the US uh, to accomplish something like this, uh, to, to <laughs> increase their efficiency, number one, but also to use waste heat, um, which, which is again, very common practice in Europe. This equipment uh, comes out of Europe. It's a Swiss engineered uh, company uh, doing the heat reclamation. So it's, it's very proven technology. Uh, it, it's, it happens to be very expensive technology, so it's not well employed or employed at all that we know of through, throughout uh, North America. Can you, would you mind going back a slide though? Yeah. I mean, you have a paragraph, if I must have one more back, back one. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, did I miss it? You have a bullet over here, main regulatory approvals, but you didn't, I don't think you talked about that. Do you have those approvals? Uh, you, I think we have a separate so slide. We're going to get into that. Yeah. We'll walk you through, um, which is part of why we're here, is uh, the Act 250 process and um, the delay. I should have really started by saying that um, the Act 250 process is the reason we're here. We're asking for a one-year extension to this timeline uh, because that process is taking some time. But we do have the details to all of that. Uh, we'll get into that. Yeah. So, so, so we... We, we will get to those those details on that. Representative Sackowitz has a question. Yeah, we're over here. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for this. Um, you mentioned that the that the heat that you're trying to recover is low quality heat. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Uh, it's it's just not it's not high high temperature. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's it's basically we're dealing with a low temperature heat, and when you're dealing with with low temperature heats, you know, on, on the order of um, you know 120 130 degrees Fahrenheit uh, year round. Um, so as a result, there's not much that you can actually accomplish with that heat. So the, the dryer system that's being designed and employed here is called a belt dryer system. Uh, literally think of it as a big conveyor belt of a mesh material, wood chips in a thin layer set atop, and we blow air up through uh, at, at nominally about 109, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, low and slow drying process, uh, you'll see some project layouts it takes hundreds of feet of dryer in order to, uh, to dry wood chips this way. Uh, the benefits being you can use low quality heat, low, low, low temperature, low grade heat, and very little off gassing. So very little VOC off gassing. Uh, so it, it can be an efficient process that way. Okay, to move forward. Okay. Um, so, so this is the belt, belt dryer that I was talking about. Um, you, you know, the gentle warming of pellets, the low VOCs, uh, they're, they're basically the lowest emitting dryers uh, as far as uh, pollutants into the atmosphere. So the distinction here is that we're not going to be burning any more fuel at the plant in order to dry these wood chips. Uh, where it's simply a recovery of, of energy that is not being utilized today. Um, so there's no additional combustion, no additional emissions. Uh, and again, that all cascades into our air quality permitting and, and, and um, permitting process through EPA. Uh, this is the overview layout of the site. What you see in blue uh, is, is kind of easily, easily looked at from, from afar. Um, those happen to be wastewater, stormwater basins, uh, uh, retention ponds, but uh, it kind of outlines the project the um you see my pointer if i do this a little bit uh the dryer system if you don't mind i'll just stand up and point out some things here the, the, this is the dryer system the belt dryer you can see kind of its, its relative um size the <laughs> existing power plant is over here and this is where the existing stack is sorry to put my back no, over here uh this is the existing stack where the heat recovery equipment will be uh located and uh, the the water lines will bring uh, this heat over to the dryer assembly, 
We have a truck on the offloading. Um, this is all wood chip storage. This is uh, basically log yard and wood chip storage. And then the pellet mill is this, this little piece actually right here. Um, and then we have a, a pellet bagging uh, facility as well. So the output of the of the this whole development will be, um, you know, Vermont's second operational, third operational wood pellet mill uh, on a scale larger than than the other mills that are there today. Um, so, any questions regarding the layout? What is the scale? About ninety thousand ton a year. Um, to put it in perspective, the Vermont Wood Pellet Company down in North Carolina, Vermont, is is about 20, 25,000 ton a year. Um, Richford, I think, just came online within the past uh, few months, and I don't, I don't think they've surpassed 10,000 ton a year. So uh, this, this is definitely a larger scale uh, facility than, than what, uh, what we see in Vermont, but equal to that in neighboring states across the board in New Hampshire and on the other side in New York as well. Representative Pat. And uh, just uh, quickly, how, how do the would the pellets be uh, distributed and marketed uh, to people? I know there are fuel dealers and others that are selling uh, wood pellets. Now. Right. Uh, good question. This this will not be a, a retail uh, facility, so it'll sell to the existing dealers within Vermont. So the Bourne's Energy, the Vermont Renewable Fuels. Uh, currently, Vermont Renewable Fuels is bringing pellets in on rail uh, from Alberta, from northern Alberta. They do have a rail siding here in, in Rygate. There are some plans to be able to develop that in the future, uh, other phases. But for now, trucks will be able to come in and load bulk pellets uh, at the mill directly um, uh, and bagged pellets as well. So bagged pellets will be going out. Uh, the goal is to offset the number of pellets coming in from Canada. Uh, so, so we're looking at an equivalent quality of pellet uh, production of these Canadian softwood pellets coming down from as far away as Northern Alberta. Um, a lot of, a lot of bag product coming over from Quebec and we believe it can compete because of the reduced trucking. So uh, you can only take 30 tons per, per truckload. Uh, and, you know, we, we're currently burning thousands upon thousands of tons coming out of Canada. So. Representative Tory. Thank you. Uh, just something to flag, because you mentioned bags. Um, and I've been hearing from constituents who cannot recycle their pellet bags. And they're really... Concerned about that is is that something that um, you would have the ability to? The plastics industry has done a magnificent job leading us to believe that all plastics are recyclable, um, and so every bag is marked with a recyclable stamp on it and the number four label. Um, and the problem is that film film recycling, plastic recycling of films is just not viable uh, here. So yes, they can be recycled, uh, but it has to be taken to the specialized recycling center, bags turned inside out, all dust removed from them. Um, so while technically they can be recycled, the practical nature of it is that they're not. Um, and so as a company like Pellergy, we've been promoting bulk wood pellet systems. Um, we set up the very first bulk pellet delivery trucks within the state. Uh, we've helped companies like Ford's Energy, Vermont Renewable Fuels, develop their bulk delivery trucks. We we install bulk delivery systems, bulk handling systems, um, so that a truck can come and you you get rid of the bags altogether. Ideally, that's where everything goes. Practically, um, we're, we're we're quite a ways off from that. Representative Smith and Satkowitz. Thank you. Uh, are you processing hardwood chips or softwood chips or so, both? Uh, the the mill will be one hundred percent dedicated to softwood, uh, particularly eastern white pine. Uh, because of the lack of other markets uh, for it. This is kind of what uh, we, at, at, in my previous uh, pellet mill, we zeroed in on as well. Um, typically, when, when you know, we're looking at forest from a forest management perspective to increase the growth in the forest, increase your, your total value, getting the white pine out is, is key. And um, there's really a lack of other markets for that. So when we looked at where can we not compete, um, anything hardwood, we compete with the firewood market for low grade. So we didn't want to go there. Uh, and that left kind of the, the pulp, pulp uh, industry and, and um, the declining paper mills and the other declining 
biomass power plants like just across in, in Berlin, for example. So right now, 100% white pine. Thank you. Representative Sackles. Yeah, um, so I thought, I thought you said that the lot of your wood coming from Canada, and so from Alberta. So there's there's Eastern white pine. That's and typically just coming out of Canada. So so the mill that uh, we're bringing pellets in from Canada on rail right now, bulk, bulk rail, uh, that's all mill residuals from dimensional lumber. So two by fours, two by sixes, two by twelves. Uh, they're sawing spruce and they're taking their sawdust and their planer shavings and making pellets from them. So it's still soft wood, uh, but that's the soft wood they have available. Very few uh, pellets coming out of Canada are, are hardwood pellets, uh, if, if any right now. There may be one manufacturer. Um, typically mills on this order of magnitude, so you know, 80, 90,000 ton a year, they're doing a mixed hardwood like uh, lignetics or, or um, New England wood pellet out of Jaffer, New Hampshire, Curran pellets up in uh, Messina, New York. They just, you know, whole tree chips, any, any species, they, they, they don't care. They bring in mixed hardwood. They mix it with hardwood, softwood. Um, but to compete in the market, a softwood pellet, a pine pellet, makes actually the highest grade, highest quality of wood pellet. Kind of counterintuitive to those of you or us who have grown up burning cordwood or have a fireplace. You know, you, you kind of always say, oh, no, I want, I want to burn hardwood. Uh, pellets are, are the opposite. You're taking pine, you're drying it, and you're condensing it, you're compressing it, and making little hardwood logs. So it's a, it's all in the processing. So I'm, I'm feeling, it, maybe I missed something, but I'm feeling a little confused. Sure. So I thought you, so, we, so you have pellets coming from Canada, but you also, but I thought you said that you were focusing on eastern white pine as... Correct. So what's... But you're, it sounds like you're actually but you're using both. So, so the the idea is to offset those pellets coming in from Canada. So, so as far as a marketplace, like we can build all these pellets, but what do we do with them? Um, we're looking to offset the market. Uh, we're looking to keep the Canadian pellets out of the market, essentially, and compete. So, on so that. you're not using the pellets from Canada. So currently. See, they're not consumers use them. The consumers, consumers are currently that's, using. That's okay, yes. my mistake. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Exactly. No. Cur currently, most of the highest quality pellets outside of Vermont Wood Pellet Company are coming down from Canada. So we're so we're looking to produce a pellet that is exceeds that quality of those Canadian pellets, so that we can disrupt that market. And so, and so you're so you're using Eastern White Pine, and so right. Where what's the nature of of that supply? Where 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 is that all coming from? And, <laughs> why so, is it coming? Why is why right. are those trees coming or those parts of trees coming to you? So we've we've been we've been told by multiple studies by multiple groups um, that there is an overabundance of white pine within about a hundred fifty mile radius of us, which is kind of stretching out to, at the outer bands of of coming in uh, to be able to uh, to be able to supply this this amount of uh, wood fiber. Um, and the white pine species is the one that needs to be cut needs to be cut frequently and that there's little to no market for it. So that's, that's kind of has been directing our. So, so this is, these are from then from managed wood lots. Exactly. Yes, people are really want to get hardwood because that's the most valuable species from their economic perspective over a long time. And they're taking out whole pine trees of various sizes then? Various sizes. And, yeah, we, we take and, everything and, down to and, about four inches diameter. Yeah. yeah, and up to about 24. Um, in, in, in our previous mill down in um, West Windsor, you know, we kind of the same questions, a um, little bit different of a, of, of a, of a fiber uh, loading there, a little bit different forest structure, but we didn't have to reach out beyond about 30 miles and just had an overabundance of, of white pine. So with, with, again, no other markets. They were, some of them were trucking to Ticonderoga, some of them New York, some of them were trucking to J, Maine. And so having something locally is, is, is really advantageous to, to the loggers. Representative Smith. Thank you. <clears throat> What's the shelf life? Is there a shelf life difference between hardwood chips or, and softwood chips? No, I mean, one, once, once you make a pellet, once you dry those chips, um, <clears throat> they really, the pellets that come out of a mill are sterile. Uh, so there's, there's no bacterial, there's no um, a fungal uh, growth within them and very little moisture. So they're, they're controlled at about 6%, 6, 8% moisture. 
Uh, so they can't sustain uh, any type of degradation at that point from, from decomposition. Uh, so a pellet in a bag, I mean, we, we've, we've seen 10 years, you know, opening bags. They're, the bags are perforated, uh, so they do get some moisture wicking into them. Um, and and moisture is really the only concern. As long as you can keep them dry, you know, out of standing water yep. and relatively low low humidity, they'll last for a long time. Okay. So I, I guess I've <laughs> it seemed like the guy to ask. Um, all the energy that goes into making a wood pellet, really, like what's the life cycle analysis on that? And are we really on the right side of the carbon equation <laughs> by using them? That's I think that's one of the kind of the neat things about this project for me is that we're recovering waste energy. So in in most pellet mill operations, your your second largest use of of energy is burning more wood chips in order to dry chips as your feed is gone for the pellets. So in this operation, we're taking waste heat that's going up the stack and and, and drying those chips. Uh, the next biggest or, or the the largest is is electricity, uh, and on this plant in particular, because Rygate is a power generation facility. They've done the equations to actually be able to utilize um, power on the plant itself to run the pellet mill, uh, and those are those are in the base calculations for efficiency. So it's it's anticipated that very little, if any, power will have to be come off the grid. So I haven't done the analysis on the actual sunk energy costs in these pellets in particular, but because of all these factors, they're they're going to be some of the, if not the lowest embodied energy, you know, pellets that. The movie on the market. I think it's it's going to be something that we can we can market to, um, but outside of that, it, it's it's not really a question the industry explores. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of inputs that you're not mentioning that are pretty petroleum based, high high energy use. Oh yeah, I, I mean, right down to the logging. Yes, you, you know, um, and the transportation, and I think that that's one of the things we're looking at is. What are the pellets that are coming from furthest away? What you know? How, how much embodied energy are they getting in in diesel running trucks over borders from thousands of miles away? And that's what we're trying to cut into there as well. Really get that embodied energy as low as we can through transportation. Yeah. And is anyone tracking how much energy it takes for the logging operations? I don't know the answer to that question. We can check on that, Madam Chair. Uh, no, go for it. <laughs> Is that, may I move on? Yes. Uh, so for the Act 155 progress so far, as you may recall from the timeline, the first goal they had to meet was by June of last year, they had to uh, file construction contracts and an efficiency certification with the PUC, which they did do. And I think actually to make, I think this, this one makes more sense visually as far as um, all of the permitting. And by the way, this is all online. You have a copy of this uh, that is required for this facility and the progress that they've made. As you can see, the first one being the Act 250 uh, major permit application, which was filed in late December. Right now, um, most everything else is complete except we're waiting on the air quality permit, which is with A&R right now. We've heard some estimations that that could be as early as June, but as late as September that we actually receive that back. And then uh, in order to get the final Act 250 um, land use permit. So at that point, uh, basically that leaves us a month to then construct the main components according to Act 155 originally. And we can stay here or I can just move on. Do you have any questions about the permitting process? We can always come back to this too. And to be clear, you're representing Pellergy? I'm representing Rygate, the owner of the plant. Yeah. And Pellergy is contracted to Rygate as well. So we're representing Rygate as well. Yeah. Um, and we can get back to this, but I just, I want to just show you here. This is why we're asking for this one year delay because uh, we would have had to have had everything, all the main components constructed by October 1 of 2024, which is just, it, it's not working with the timeline of the Act 250 process, which is why we're asking for a one-year delay. And 
by moving the construction back one year, that also moves everything else back by one year, which includes the Department of Public Service certification that we've met the efficiency standard and uh, the PUC rate case. It moves that back by one year as well. Uh, and that's really what our ask is. Um, the 10,000 foot overview on that is that the owners have taken every step all along the way to meet the timeline criteria, including filing for and having the Act 250 permitting process. The engineering is ready to go. Um, it's literally ready to release to manufacturer, um, but without permitting and without those final permits coming through, there could be significant changes in that engineering that have to be rolled back in. So the entire project is effectively at a standstill awaiting Act 250. And when did they submit their Act 250 application? Uh, December 28th, last year. And the hearing was in February, I believe. Yes, and uh, you know, they were waiting. I mean, the PUC determined Reg uh submittal satisfied the requirements of Act 155. They were waiting on that too as well in December in order to actually file the Act 250 um, permit in December. And do you want to touch on some of the benefits of that? Uh, sure. Yeah. So the three to four uh, new new jobs in the area is um, extremely low. <laughs> from from my last analysis, I was up to twenty one people uh, at the at the pellet mill itself um, because the mill has to run. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Whenever the power plant is running, we have to be drying chips and making pellets. So that's a three shift operation, um, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And uh, you can't do that with just three, three, three people. Isn't this your slide? Uh, it, it, it is, and it's something that I, I'm pointing out as inaccurate on here right now. <laughs> uh, this is a bare minimum uh, that I would say uh, you can take to the bank, but I, I can also say that we're going through those analyses right now and looking at what these actual staffing looks like and what the skill sets are. And we're looking at three to four times this amount as a minimum. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll be looking at increasing uh, the overall logging foresting uh, jobs in the area and buying uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of, of, of more green biomass into the facility in, in the way of that uh, white pine. Uh, we're looking at property tax increase, approximately two hundred thousand um, dollars, just due to the additional development. This is about eighteen to twenty-three million dollar project, depending on how you cut it and where you cut it between the between the pellet mill operations and the heat recovery. Uh, so, so we're looking at increased taxes there. Um, we're we're also looking at being able to <clears throat> sell product to other existing Vermont fuel dealers in the way of either dried chips. Um, not, every, not every chip that gets dried through the facility, through the weight heat, waste heat recovery has to be turned into a pellet. We can also send dried chips out um, to existing suppliers and producers. Uh, that is a market that is emerging. Uh, I was just over in Germany uh, two weeks ago looking at brand new wood chip boilers to be brought over and they're all a dry chip boiler which lower your emissions and also lower the amount of uh, chips you have to put into a boiler. So for example, the boiler across the street that heats this whole facility, that's a wet chip boiler. Uh, if they were to tweak control systems, start accepting dry chips, their tonnage, the number of trucks going into that facility per year would, would go down. It wouldn't have to burn off as much moisture in the chip. Uh, so so that's, that's something we're looking at as well, kind of dovetailing into the clean heat standard. Um, and overall, looking at looking at the the you know extended viability of of the of the power plant. Uh, without this, that the power plant um, does not exist. Uh, we and we've seen that time and time again uh, when when the PPAs have been uh, ha have been canceled or not extended in other states, namely Maine and New Hampshire, um, even mills from this particular owner, uh, they. They go into bankruptcy. They they cannot. Uh, they they no longer cease to to exist, uh, including the the closest one to us, which is over in Berlin, New Hampshire, that declared bankruptcy just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we're looking at um, you know extending this for the for the future of of both the Rygate, the mill, and and our renewable energy standards. Um, 
as as far as uh, the environmental impacts, you know, we're looking at this reduced carbon footprint through through the use of wood pellets. Um, wood pellets are a carbon better technology. They're not a carbon <laughs> technology. Um, both officially, as probably most of you are aware, uh, through ISO regulations and, and international treaties, the wood pellets are considered carbon neutral. Uh, I think that most studies here uh, that, that we work off of say they're anywhere from you know, 60 to 70 percent carbon better, depending on as, as local as you can get them. So we're really doing this looking at that embodied energy, as we spoke about earlier, reducing truck traffic, uh, potentially reducing moisture content in, in wood chips for other manufacturers to reduce theirs. Um, if you have any other questions on that. I think we've already we've gone touched through these. on that. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Is it a bungar? Just as a to, just for a sense of scale. How many how many tons did you say that you'll be producing and selling of chips? No. Yeah, the design output is ninety thousand tons. How does that compare to what you're burning in the system now? Uh, currently, I believe. Wait, I wrote it down. Currently, the they're they're at about two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, two hundred fifty thousand ton of green chips a year is what they bring into the facility. With our ninety thousand ton output, we're we're looking at effectively doubling that. Uh, because when you're dealing with white pine, for example, you're typically bringing in 2.4 tons of logs to make one ton of wood pellets. You're, you, what you lose in the process is uh, bark off of the logs, which is typically turned into uh, mulch landscaping, mulch salt to mulch contractors, uh, and, and you're densifying, densifying that wood and you're losing moisture content. Uh, so, so we're losing anywhere from design basis 55 to even as much as 60 percent moisture so just water all right thank you thank you so i mean just you say you went over this requested amendments you're asking for the, everything in green over here so to clarify madam chair we came in to the legislature asking for a one-year extension um there have been other parties and i think representative farless for bio will speak to uh some concerns that have come up and and since then we've had a kind of a long process behind the scenes of negotiating on some draft amendments which you will see presented to you today that we have not seen the final version enough but i it's based on conceptions we agree conceptually to uh what has i know you sent it to me i just haven't quite read it yet um but i'm sure it's exactly what we have all asked for in which case we you know we are on board with that moving forward. Thanks. Um, next we hear from one. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Representative Pat. Do you have a question for? Yeah. I just, I just in your own analysis, um, have you also? I know there has been some, I'd say at least high level analysis of the uh, impact of having this kind of activity as part of uh, forestry economy in terms of uh, preserving forest land rather than it being subdivided. Um, do you have any, uh, I know that would be a rough estimate, but have you done any looking into that uh, in that direction? It's, it's, it's really hard to, to, to say. <laughs> um, I think there's, there's probably others that are more qualified to speak to you know the impact of an additional, you know, two hundred fifty thousand tons of of white pine being purchased on a yearly basis in this area. Um, you know, obviously we pull from a wood basket that is 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 largely Vermont, uh, uh, but but also extends into New Hampshire and and, and even into Maine as well. Um, but but you're right. I, I mean, without without a market for for your logs. Through a managed forest plan, um, your your land becomes more valuable to subdivide and develop. Uh, and I think that you know landowners we, we face this every day. <laughs> um, so so that's that's another reason kind of keying in on that that white pine uh, to to give a market to where there's not much of one right now. Thank you. Um, all right. With that, I think we'll hear from legislative council.
Okay. Ellen Chikowski, Office of Legislative Council. So you should have just gotten draft 3.1 of a proposed amendment to S305 on base load power. And you will recall that uh, 30 VSA section 809 is the base load renewable power portfolio requirement, which is part of the renewable energy chapter. And this statute is about a base load renewable power plant, and that is code for Rygate. That is the one plant that satisfies the requirements of that statute. And so this entire statute 8009 relates to the Rygate facility. So in 2022, there was an amendment to this statute and Act 155 that put in this requirement for Rygate to increase its overall efficiency of its plant um, in order to get an updated, essentially, power purchase agreement. Um, and so you did just hear some of that information already, but I can go into additional detail on that statute if you'd like. Um, otherwise, on page one, it's extending the dates, as just mentioned, by one year. So moving from November 1, 2026 to November 1, 2027, the PUC shall determine for the period beginning November 1, 2027 and ending November 1, 2032, the price to be paid to a plant used to satisfy the base load renewable power portfolio requirement, which is right gate. So this is the paragraph that establishes that the PUC shall set the rate to be paid. That rate is what the utilities need to pay. So in general, Section 8009 establishes that all of the electric utilities, um, except Burlington Electric, because they have a power facility, a base load power facility, need to purchase their pro rata share of the output of the baseload renewable power plant, Rygate. So they divide it up by their percentage. So GMP has the largest and then the other uh, utilities based on their pro rata usage. So the PUC sets the rate to be paid by those utilities to Rygate for their power. There is an existing rate in statute that is uh, set to expire November 1, 2026 at which time if the rest of the elements of the statute are complied with, PUC will set a new rate for them going forward to end on November 1, 2032. So. There are- Does it make sense to extend one on one end and not the other? Well, that is a policy question. Um, this rate was, this update was passed in two, uh, 2022. And so they were given a 10 year window at that time. So you could choose if you would like to extend it to 2033 or 2034, um, if you would like, uh, this is the request before you. Mm -hmm. On page two, so in Act 155, there was these, the uh, subsection K was added to establish the co-location and efficiency requirements. You just heard about the project that has been identified to meet these co-location and efficiency requirements. So then on page two, the dates are being changed here for the rest of the uh, deadlines in this process. So on or before October 1, 2025, the owner of the plant shall submit to the commission and the department a certification that the main components of the facility used to meet the requirement of subdivision one of this subsection have been manufactured and that the construction plans for the facility have been completed. 
So there's two things happening here. So one is the date change of one year, because otherwise this deadline is October 1, 2024. And I think you just heard they are probably not going to meet that currently. But also currently the statute reads that the main components of the facilities used to meet this requirement have to have been completed by then. And so this is actually adding additional language that I just want to flag is, is different. It says they have been manufactured and that the construction plans have been completed. So what did it say before? I'm just trying to, I'm looking at it in statute. It was silent on that before? It just said completed. So there have been discussions about what does completed mean. In drafting, I thought it was fairly clear that that meant constructed yes. at the site. It did not say that. And in the version that may have been posted last week, it said completed at the plant, as was my suggestion originally. Uh, but this says manufactured and the construction plans at the facility have been completed. I'm not entirely sure where that specific phrase came from. Bridget Morris. Chime in. Uh, so uh, again, on behalf of Rygate Associates, from our research into the uh, discussions back in 2022 in House Energy and Technology, that's where the language was discussed. And um, from what we have determined, I think the intent was that those components would be completed, not necessarily assembled and up and running, which is why the eight to nine months later, the department then comes and certifies if they're in fact meeting the Act 155 criteria, which is up and running. So I think the, the plant owner at the time when they were moving through Act 155, that was the intention. But manufacture these and then they would have eight months to bring them together and have them up and running for the department to certify and make the recommendation to the PUC. Okay. So you're saying you cannot have this thing constructed by October 1, 2025. I'm, I'm not saying that they cannot, Madam Chair. I think it's in their best interest to get it up and running, but because we're waiting on the Act 250 permits from what I've been told is that they cannot sign off on the engineering and they can't, um, the engineering contracts and engineering plans until all of the permits are back in hand. And when they do that, then they start construction of those pieces, which could take up to a year is my understanding. And then they still have to get them to the site and assemble them and get them up and running by the time the department comes to certify them. So have these components been manufactured? No. <clears throat> the, the design uh, engineering has been done uh, and as much as possible, the components that have been selected are uh, proven technologies. There's nothing radically new, um, but it takes time to manufacture these. The, the pellet mill, for example, the mill itself will be manufactured in essentially shipping containers and then brought up together on site, locked together on site and integrated together uh, with these shipping containers. So the, the technology that been chosen it is, uh, you know, different than anything else that exists again in, in New England because of that, but it's really to meet the timeline. Uh, in order to build a pellet mill from scratch, uh, you know, from, from groundbreaking everything, you'd be looking at e easily 18 to 24 months. So in this compressed timeline, for, due to Act 155, the engineering was done so that most of the mill could be constructed off-site, brought on-site. There's obviously site preparation that has to be done. There has to be the whole heat reclamation system, a lot of other work. Uh, but the longest lead items that have been designed and engineered to be brought on-site 90% manufactured uh, so that the on-site work is, is very minimal. Where's the completion date in this amendment? The, the date that the PUC certifies. September of um, 11926. I'm not answering this question. Okay, when you Representative Sevilla. Well, it's a, it's has to the PUC has to certify. 
the department um, investigates and submits a recommendation to the commission by September 1 of 2026 in our proposed new timeline. Right now, it's September 1 of 2025. It has to be operational. Okay. And certified well, meeting by the, that date. Meeting the criteria. So, so you're getting, you're asking for a two year extension based on the language that we're looking at. Well, so just from the perspective of the company owners and from speaking with their previous representation, I think they, this is really just a one year extension. Of course, we understand that the language could be interpreted differently. I do see that, uh, but that was not the intent originally. So on page two, and you can see in the next two paragraphs, um, subsection four and subsection five, um, the dates have been changed there. So in subsection four, if the contract and certification requirements of subsection two are not submitted to the commission and the department on or before July 1, 2023, which already happened, or if the certification under subdivision three is not submitted to the commission and department on or before October 1, 2020, Five, so that's moving out from 2024 to 2025. Then the obligation under this section for each Vermont retail electricity provider, aka utility, to purchase a pro rata share of the baseload renewal power portfolio requirement shall cease on November 1, 2025. And the commission is not required to conduct the rate determination provided for in subsection D of this section. So then the next date is um, on or before September 1, 2026, the department shall investigate and submit a recommendation to the commission on whether the plant has achieved the requirements of subdivision one. If the department recommends that the plant has not achieved the requirement of subdivision one, the obligation under this section shall cease on November 1, 2026, and the commission is not required to conduct the rate determination. And then finally on page three, the last date is updated so after November 1, 2027, the owner of the plant shall report annually to the department and the department shall verify the overall efficiency of the plant for the prior 12 month period. If the overall efficiency of the plant falls below the requirement of sub subdivision one, the report shall include a plan to return the plant to the required efficiency within one year. And then that brings you back to subdivision D, which is on the first page where the PUC then starts the rate determination for 2027 to 2032. So you have, ex in the prior legislation, you extended the existing rate for these additional years. There will be, a, if all goes according to this schedule, there will be a new rate determination in 2027 to 20 for the last five years of the contract. And then, okay, so then there's a new session law provision on pages three and four. So at the bottom of page three, biomass suppliers and construction, the owner of the plant used to satisfy the baseload renewable power portfolio requirement under section 8009 shall offer to enter into written contracts with each of its biomass suppliers. So on to page four, establishing customary commercial terms, including payment timelines, Supply volume and term length. Offer to? Yes. Okay. For biomass suppliers that are not a party to a supply contract with the plant owner as of April 1, 2024, the plant owner shall offer to provide supply contracts to ensure payment to such suppliers for biomass deliveries within seven business days of the invoice date. Um, I just want to flag that I don't fully understand the distinction between subsec subsection A and B. Uh, well, one has an offered contract, and apparently one doesn't. Uh, the plant, and maybe it has to do with the date. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, the plant owner shall ensure that the payments made to each biomass supplier are timely, accurate, and valid. 
In the event any payment is not timely made under the terms of a supplier contract, the plant owner shall pay a late payment penalty to the supplier equal to 5% per week. The plant owner shall hire an independent certified public accountant to review the timeliness of the plant owner's payments to its suppliers and to prepare a quarterly report detailing its findings. The quarterly report shall also include a status report on the design and construction of the facility proposed to meet the requirements of um, 30 BSA section 8009K. Each quarterly report shall be verified under the penalty of perjury and provided to the General Assembly and the Department of Public Service. The requirements of this section shall apply until the Commission establishes the new avoided cost paid to the plant in accordance with uh, 8009D, after which point the obligations under this section shall cease. So until the 2027 date, um, the plant owner shall offer to uh, have contracts with suppliers and they shall have an independent CPA to review the timeliness of their payments. Um, can you go through E again, though? The requirements of section shall apply. What happens? That's what I just said. It's This is a time-limited provision that applies until the new rate stout establishes. So after 2027 and the new rate is established, they don't have to have an independent CPA and they don't have to have contracts. New rate for the electricity. Isn't this, this is for the loggers, I thought. So uh, the new rate here being referenced is for the PPA, right? Yeah. And so, and that will be, um, that will be um, developed for a public process. Yes. Where presumably um, the suppliers could weigh in and potentially secure this term for themselves going forward. I don't know. Well, I'm saying, so uh, what's happening here is the, the terms um, end when the new PPA is approved. And so the PPA will be developed through a public process. And as a part of that public process, presumably the suppliers could be engaged and could make requests. The PUC is not here, but the department is. They, if we could them a lifeline. I, I don't know that I can. I'm likewise yeah. I'm sure that the I don't think the entire PPA would be renegotiated. I think it's more a matter of the PUC doing a calculation and plugging in a new rate. Instead of 10 cents, it will be X cents. So I am also not sure that there'd be room to kind of renegotiate the whole contract, which is the PPA, which is between the utilities and Reggie. Yeah, I, I could look into that a little bit more, but not sure. And, and what happens at Rygate if this pellet plant doesn't get built? So the timelines in here, so the next timeline, there's the, if you were to go with this bill, uh, and this would become the law, so they have to have, have construction plans by 2025, and then the department will investigate if they have achieved the requirements. So the requirements are to have a co-location project and that the plant overall efficiency increases to 50%. And that deadline is September 1, 2026. At which point, if they have not met that deadline, the obligation um, for utilities to purchase the power ceases. And by that point, the PUC would not start the new rate determination. Members have further questions for legislative council? Not seeing any. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Melissa Bailey. Hi. 
And thanks for having me back, uh, Melissa Bailey with the Department of Public Service. <clears throat> so um, just can say overall at a high level, the department is supportive of the provisions of the latest draft, um, the amendment and, um, sorry, just getting there. Um, so you've heard the, the background that Act 155 um, essentially extended a 10 year contract that had been in place from 2012 and set to expire in 2022 and, and put the requirements that the efficiency project be built at the Rygate plant. Um, we understand that there have been delays in the permitting that you've just heard about um, for specifically for the efficiency project. Um, and so we're comfortable with this one year extension again to um, to essentially all of the remaining deadlines that Rite Aid is subject to. Um, and in addition, provides this clarity around what it means to have the components um, constructed because it sounds like there were different legal interpretations of the existing language. So the bill allows for a one year extension, clarifies um, the piece about having the components constructed and um, pushes back the time at which the new rate would be set. And then again, um, provides these um, provisions around timely payment to suppliers, which we feel is important um for the for the plant to continue its ppa um understanding from rygate's perspective that if the ppa were to cease which would happen um if they fail to meet this upcoming october deadline in 2024 um we, we understand from rygate that they just would be in an untenable economic situation and the plant would close down um just for a little bit of context the way the department looks at this type of decision um the, the PPA that we've talked about, I think just to, just to explicitly clarify, this is a must buy PPA. So the utilities don't have a choice about purchasing this resource. Um, and the, the plant receives a rate that is different from what it would be eligible to receive if it were just selling power and capacity and renewable energy credits on the market. So there's an exchange there, right? You, um, you have a guaranteed buyer at a higher price. Um, and we look at, you know, what are the benefits then that Vermont gets for paying that higher price? <clears throat> So initially we look at repayer economic value and then any other value streams kind of that the plant would, um, that would, they would bring. And we do see those in economic development benefits, um, the taxes, the employment, uh, and this potential to have um, a local supply of wood chips <clears throat> for um, advanced biomass heating um, in the state. So again, the current contract is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. That is above market prices. That's ratepayers are paying more for this power than they are for other sources of power, although not all other sources of power. You know, Rygate um, power kind of sits between um, market power at the lower end and, you know, some of our more expensive solar resources um, at the higher end. So that 10 cents is kind of in the middle. Uh, and another benefit of Rygate is that I don't think it's been touched on. It is um, what we call baseload power. So it's around, available around the clock, which is different than most of the other resources cited um, within Vermont. Uh, I think Ms. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Morris referenced about 150,000 megawatt hours are generated at the plant uh, annually, and that's about two to three percent of um, Vermont's overall power supply needs. So it is it's a small component, but it's an important you know baseload resource. Um, again, there's the economic, um, the local economy benefits, the wood industry, and the taxes and employment. Um, we think, you know, looking at that, uh, the department sees this as a reasonable balance to continue paying, again, the, the slightly higher rate um, and keeping Rygate online and able to pursue the efficiency project. We're supportive of, um, yeah, supportive of the proposal and I'm happy to take any questions. First up questions. I should say, sorry, the only other piece of data I was going to share was that the thermal efficiency of the plant is currently about 22%. And again, that we think the um, <clears throat> the efficiency project would increase the overall efficiency by 50%. So again, really think it's important to get that project built and to allow adequate time for that to happen, as opposed to losing the resource. Just to be clear, that means going from 20, 22 to 53, 50% 50. 50 more. My understanding was 50% more. I think Ledge Council just said increase to 50%, but I don't think that is, I believe it's an increasing the efficiency by 50%. I think it's the 33. Yes. Yeah, okay. And, and the department would, would need to hire consultants and certify that um, in 2026 under the proposal. Okay. Uh, Melissa, what are the baseload um, power generation plants in the state of Vermont? So really just our, it would just be Rygate and McNeil, the 
biomass plant in Burlington would be our only baseload resources. You would consider some, some of the hydro. Some of the hydros would probably be considered most of the hydros, although many of them really have seasonal fluctuations uh, based on water. So I don't think most of them would be truly considered baseload. Hydro Quebec, of course, but that's an import. McNeil runs year round and has. Um, I can't hear you if you're speaking. That was, I, I didn't know if that if that was all year all year long or not because I thought McNeil shuts down in the summer. My understanding is McNeil has some planned outages each year, but those can be planned around rather than being it you know a truly intermittent resource like solar, wind. Right. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Representative Pop. I just had a quick comment because those of us who were on the previous Energy and Technology Committee dealt, dealt with this and, and actually uh, toured the plant uh, at, at the time. Uh, at the time, uh, the, the Rygate plant was considering um, other uses for the waste heat, which I think would have been be beneficial, uh, but they were uh, to use them for other industrial purposes not specifically for energy related purposes. And so I, I, um, uh, I think that would have been good as well, but I like, I, I like better uh, that this would be uh, creating a, a local source for um, wood pellets. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and I think we have Sam Lincoln on the Zoom joining us. Welcome, Sam. I'm, I'm here, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you. I'll start whenever you're ready. You're yeah, ready. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. For the record, my name is Sam Lincoln. I own and operate a Master Logger certified mechanized timber harvesting business in Randolph Center. My, in addition to my career as a farmer and logger in central Vermont, I also served four years as the deputy commissioner at the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation from 2017 through 2020. Uh, as a logging contractor at times, I, I, I have been an indirect supplier at Rygate Power Station since the mid 2000s, providing wood fuel to the plant through third party chipping and trucking contractors. The market provided by Rygate Power Station is incredibly important to Vermont's forest economy and provides forest landowners with options to market forest products harvested from their land, often in accordance with forest management plans. The effort to upgrade the efficiency of the plant and utilize more locally harvested forest products and offset the fuel are important goals that I support. Um, my testimony will be really brief and focused on the biomass suppliers section on page four. Um, it is an industry standard for suppliers of forest products, plants, and purchasers of sawmills, firewood producers, power plants to be paid on a weekly basis for those deliveries. I am aware of issues with the timeliness of payments to the fuel suppliers that have gone on uh, sporadically for several years. Um, I believe the language here will be an important requirement to put in place to ensure the suppliers defined in the language are paid on time particularly at a time when the weather has had an extraordinarily negative impact on the cash flow and finances of all logging and forest trucking businesses. I would respectfully ask that the committee include it as they consider the bill, and I would be happy to take questions. Sure, I guess I'd be curious, um, why don't these folks already just have contracts? Um, it's, it's variable with many businesses, frequently businesses done on um, handshake or um, by someone's word. And at times they are done by contract. And um, it's, it's that, that part of it's not, not always consistent to have written contracts. Um, it's still somewhat of a, uh, like I said, a, a, a handshake basis with some people, but some of these have been multi-generational businesses doing business together with each other for a long time and not having any issues. But we believe there is a need here to address this in this language. 
it seems like existing contract law should cover this and that we're um, restating the obvious. Well, we feel that um, with the benefit of the um, rate payers uh, providing a profit to the plant and, and having public support that uh, this, we believe this needs to be addressed um, because it has been an inconsistent uh, payment uh, payment timeliness. Um, and that's, that's why we're asking for it. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And I, I don't mean to sound like I don't support the loggers getting paid because I 100% do. <laughs> But it just seems like this language isn't, does it add, I'm going to ask our alleged counsel this question, does this add any level of enforcement that doesn't already exist in yes. statute? Okay. Well, so contract law is tricky, especially if there isn't a written, a written document, because the party that has been violated would need to then seek to go to court to enforce something and then bring evidence of past dealings. So the burden at that point is on the party that has been harmed. So yes, while they might prevail, they would have to bring a lawsuit potentially. And then that would be a burden on top of the fact that they, depending on what the, how much they're out, there's a cost benefit analysis there, right? Like if they're, if they're, Sorry, can I come over here? Yeah, so, um, so if a contract has been delayed by three or four weeks, but they still get paid, and the argument was, well, you did get paid, and perhaps there isn't a, um, if there's no contract, what's the penalty on that? Then they'd have to help hire a lawyer to help them establish if there's been damages and what those damages would be. So at that point, without a, without a contract, it is a burden on the injured party to then bring these this person to court. So, yeah, but so this, yes, it could get sorted out. This, this language is not guaranteeing a contract. It says it shall offer to enter into a written contract, which I guess means they would have to come to the table. But then it also has a second paragraph for suppliers not party to a contract, which is I'm hearing what we have right now. Um, Madam Chair, could I, might I offer some insight on this may, one? May. Um, so so I, I can't speak directly from the Rye perspective, but from my experience running and operating a pellet mill uh, for a couple of years, and, and I think I think Mr. Smith has, has, has alluded to this as well, many in the logging industry don't operate off of contracts. They, they, they bring a truck over your scales, and they expect to get paid at the end of the week for what they bring over your scales. That's kind of the the unspoken industry standard. Um, whereas when you're operating a business, a lot of times you work on net 30 kind of terms. So if I don't have a contract with someone and, and we didn't have contracts with over 70, you know, loggers and suppliers that, that brought material in, um, we would say, look, you're, you're on net, net 30 terms with us. And that doesn't mean a lot to some people. <laughs> and we would have loggers consistently show up and say, you haven't paid me in two weeks. You know, where, where's my check for, for all the logs that, that have brought in the last two weeks? And we said, well, you know, our standard terms are, are 30 days to pay, and we don't have an, another written contract with you, so you'll get paid within the 30-day time frame. And I think that operating in that mode has created a lot of tension, and it created a lot of tension, you, you know, for our operation as well. So, so by, by mandating that you have to at least offer a contract, and you have to offer a contract with the seven day terms that they're used to, it gives the loggers that, that leverage to be able to say, hey, I, I want to enter this contract. I know I'm going to get paid on time. And if I'm not, you're going to pay a penalty for it. Um, and, and I just think that, you, you know, that that's, it, it's trying to alleviate that, that issue of kind of running big business on like a net 30 day term. And if you want a contract, we'll give you a contract otherwise, bring your logs and we'll cut you a check. And when we can cut you a check, bridging that gap between the logger's expectation of, I've got my pay slips on, on, the, on the seat of my cab, in my truck, and I want to get paid every seven days for it. And, and I think that, that that's, that's basically what this serves to achieve. Sam Lincoln. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one way that I could, a couple things is I appreciate your, um, uh, Highlighting this is it is 
um, some, it is unusual, I think, for group, uh, you know, uh, businesses to ask for something like this to be inserted. But it, again, we believe it's necessary in the, in this market, in the in the um, wood energy market, in the pulp and paper market. It is typical for logging contractor suppliers to have written contracts. The sawmill world, it's it's a lot more of word of mouth. I think I would I would adjust what I said to you previously about that. Um, and uh, for the the history of the Regate Power Station, um, the prior to the current ownership. The payments were made to logging contractors on time, and the suppliers that go to Burlington Electric are paid on time. The paper mills, the pulp mills in the region, they are paid on time. And um, this particular plant gets a gets a favorable treatment from the General Assembly in Vermont, and some of that is based on the assumption that that is trickling down to the forest economy and supply chain all the way back to landowners. And as has, we've experienced for several years, has been that. Um, that isn't always happening. And so that's why we're asking for that because there's um, there's a lot at stake for um, the individual businesses um, that uh, are do not collectively bargain or have collective um, capacity. I'm not quite sure what the right legal terminology is to um, uh, work and con challenge um, a business that they rely on for much of their income. And so that might be too why you don't see um, a line of logging contractors that are suppliers of the plant here to testify in something that might not be favorable to their business relationship with them. Mm -hmm. They have a lot at stake and um, financially and, and uh, for their business logistics. I guess I, what happens if they don't do this, Ellen? Not us, if the Frygate doesn't abide by this stat, this session law. Um, well, there's no direct enforcement provision. Um, uh, Yeah, that's interest in trust, Ellen, right? Well, there is interest in part of it. Um, so uh, if they don't pay under the terms of a contract, it's requiring a contract term of penalty of 5%. If they haven't paid, they're probably not going to add 5%. Um, but uh, if you're looking, I there isn't a clear tie to whether or not it impacts whether or not their obligation to get the PPA rate is not clearly tied to this. It is a statutory obligation, or it's a session law provision that is being added, and session law provisions have the effect of law, so it would be a statute, but there isn't a clear enforcement mechanism. Melissa Bailey. Melissa Bailey, the department. I was just going to point out that there is the quarterly reporting by the certified public accountant who could come to the General Assembly as well as the department. So I think there's the timeliness with which you all would receive any concerns about payment. It's not enforcement, but it is a notification provision. Sam, I, I would I would I would add that that uh, that, uh, that that includes documentation through this to the auditor or the the. Um, I can't remember what the, if it's yeah, the it, it it includes it includes documentation through the CPA that then um, would be available. CPA that they have to hire. Yeah, <laughs> just saying. All right. Uh, further questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. All right, members. Let's. Um, Take a break. All right, we are reconvening our meeting and taking up S two thirteen, flood resiliency bill with Rob Evans from the Agency of Natural Resources. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me back. And I'll just repeat for the record: Rob Evans, Rivers Program Manager in ANR, here to talk to you today about river corridors and flood hazard areas as it relates to S two thirteen. 
This is my flow kind of run of show here. I think it's worth just getting everybody to a base level understanding. I think you heard a little bit about this last week from others, but just reminding ourselves um, of the areas we regulate with respect to flood hazards, um, flood hazard areas, river corridors. What's the difference, the distinction um, walkthrough of the patchwork regulatory jurisdictions that we're involved in supporting or directly administering, depending. Um, take a little time to talk about how river corridor regulation works now, how that might be the same or maybe slightly modified going forward if S213 becomes law. Um, and then close with uh, the resource needs of my program to implement what is a lot of work completed over a three and a half year period. So just a reminder, flood hazard areas are those inundation floodplains that are mapped by the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA. That red blob in the lower left is, is that inundation flood hazard area in Waterbury. Um, development requires a permit if it's in a FEMA map flood hazard area, either by the town or the state, depending on jurisdiction. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's also the area that triggers mandatory flood insurance purchase requirements for federally backed secured loans. Think mortgages, because the National Flood Insurance Program is about insurable buildings, ultimately, because it's an insurance program. The key tenant or standard, I guess I should say, the flood hazard area regulation through the National Flood Insurance Program is elevation of insurable buildings. There are a lot of other related standards, but the primary one is elevation of buildings above the base flood elevation. That's synonymous with the 100-year flood elevation, or more accurately, the 1% annual chance flood elevation. The idea being the more you elevate that structure, the less risk it has from inundation flooding. Um, and that is an effective way to mitigate buildings. And Historically, flood insurance premiums, if you elevate two or even higher than the base flood elevation, are affordable. Um, and that's the goal, is to limit the risk and exposure to the flood insurance program by elevating new development above that base flood elevation. Uh, Representative Smith has a question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. That picture of the house you got there shows the uh, base flood elevation. Now, right now, say, for example, if that house is out of the river corridor, and it becomes part of in the river corridor, what's that gonna to do to the owner's evaluation of the home? It's gonna shatter it, won't it? Potentially, potentially. Um, and it depends on who's doing their homework in terms of the evaluation there. I mean, flood insurance isn't required if it's in the river corridor and not in the flood hazard area. Well, if it's not required right now, because that house is not in the river corridor, once it becomes in the expanded river quarter, will it be required to get flood insurance? No. But, well, but it's, this house is in the flood hazard area. Okay, just, I'm just using corridors. that for an example. I'm just saying that once this river quarter does potentially get expanded, is it going to destroy a lot of homeowners' opportunities to sell their home for what the market value is now? Potentially. Potentially. I don't have a firm answer for that, but um, a real a, a real assessment of at-risk structures that should be taken into account in terms of the risk to that structure. Um, don't want to get into it here, but flood disclosure is part and parcel of that. People understanding what they're buying, the level of risk, et cetera. Sure, well, if the house is not in, I guess I'm fighting a losing battle here, but uh, if the house is not in a flood zone right now and all of a sudden it's designated a flood zone. That's going to take a potential home value of $400,000 and turn it into $300,000 at the flick of a pen if we change the flood corridors, correct? Depends on who, I mean, who, is somebody reassessing the value of that? I mean, I, I think a question is, are town listers going back to their roles and saying, oh, these towns are in the, or, excuse me, these structures are now in the river corridor? We're going to adjust the value downward. I'm not aware that that's happened or happening, but I think that potential is there. How um, many homes are there in the in this potential change? Um, we don't have firm E nine one one points are the best proxy or surrogate we have. There's somewhere in the order of twelve thousand E nine one one points in our mapped river corridors. 
and over 40,000 parcels are partially or wholly within the map. Thank you. Thank you. I think the next slide demonstrates, Brian, it doesn't really matter where we draw the line. Yeah, the, I guess the point here is elevation above an inundation against an inundation hazard is affected if that's the nature of your hazard. Of course, here, that's not the nature of the hazard. Um, and that's what river corridors are really trying to get <laughs> different dynamics. Um, you know, this is a classic. I think Brian saw the slide. He oh, goes okay. down. House? Yep, same house. The same house. And the good news is, good. and the good news is, after this was posted, this was Irene damage and buyout from FEMA, and that's now deed restricted as open space. And that's what we call the hundred year flood, was it? Um, it was it was different levels depending on the river for Irene. It was a ten year flood, a hundred year flood, a five hundred year flood, depended on the river. Sure. Oh, the guy's got a great gravel pit now. Yeah. Um. Just another look at this. Yeah, you know, this is a classic reach, but we see this all over the state, which is the Browns River and Underhill. FEMA restudied the, the Browns River, new mapping, new modeling a little over a decade ago. And you can see there with those yellow circles, the river is already starting to punch outside of that. And that's really due, if you look to the lower left there, of the river being historically dredged, it's incised, it's disconnected from its floodplain. So, so much of that flow is con contained within a deepened and widened channel. Um, the river is really trying to meander, um, and that's really what the river corridor is about, is understanding that rivers are dynamic. You know, the FEMA map is a snapshot in time of the location of the river and what's underwater based on the condition at the time they studied it. We have maps that are still 40 years old and official in a lot of the state. That's changing, but um, the river corridor is about appreciating that rivers need time and space to either maintain a stable dimension and plan form um, or restore to a stable dimension and plan form. This is counterintuitive because you look at that image over 30 plus years and the river is, is moving. When we talk about stability, we're talking about vertical stability. This is the river maintaining a stable slope such that it's not excessively down cutting or excessively filling up. And, and integral to that is the river maintaining connection to its floodplain. So, River flows in excess of the mean annual flood to get out onto the floodplain and spread out and slow down and drop sediment. And that's what we want where we have undeveloped river corridors. And the good news is in Vermont, we have a lot of opportunity to protect uh, undeveloped river corridors. Um, this is what the river corridor mapping looks like. If you pull it up on our natural resources atlas, publicly available, public facing. Um, we first published this in 2015. We had various directives after Irene through Act 138 and creating this map to support our new rule was one of the activities. Um, you basically break the river corridor mapping into two subsets. There's the mapped polygon, which is larger rivers and streams draining greater than two square miles, about 5,600 miles of river. Um, that's the universe contemplated in S213 to regulate those larger rivers and streams. And we also have the smaller headwater streams, uh, which is about 8,600 miles of river, draining less than two square miles. Uh, the river corridor in those instances is simply a 50-foot setback from the top of the stream bank. So if you want to think of a width, it's 100 feet plus whatever the channel width is. Um, so S213 is not looking at regulating those. It's just looking at those larger rivers and streams. Just a quick walk through again of the, the flood hazard area uh, jurisdictions that my program supports and administers. First is municipal regulation. Again, National Flood Insurance Program. Most land uses in FEMA map floodplains are still regulated at the local level. Then we have Act 250 where we consider Criterion 1D uh, and, and advise district commissions for flood hazard area and river corridor impacts. And then lastly is our rule, the flood hazard area and river corridor rule that came online in 2015. Um, just digging in a little bit deeper, uh, National Flood Insurance Program regulation, 90% of towns, those green towns are enrolled in the program. And again, the deal they make with FEMA is for flood insurance to be available to their citizens, they need to adopt at least the federal minimum standards and enforce those standards, which means issuing permits. 
97 communities have adopted some mix of higher standards, but it's very uneven across towns. And then we have 29 of those communities that have adopted townwide river corridor regulations. I'm gonna focus a lot more of this talk on river corridors, but I'll pause here to say a key important element in uh, S213 is the creation of a state minimum set of floodplain standards. Right now we have model municipal regulations that we offer towns to consider, but it's voluntary. They can adopt them if they want to. This would make it mandatory to have a certain higher level of minimum standards. To in, and it increases consistency across town boundaries. It implements the state's no adverse impact criteria to make sure you're not pushing water onto other properties or downstream to other communities. Um, it's also a very opportune time because we're engaging with most towns in the state over the next eight years because FEMA is updating maps statewide and towns have to open up the hood on their regulations and make sure they meet at least FEMA standards. And so instead of offering minimum standards and trying to assuage them to adopt those higher standards, just having a higher floor would be much more beneficial um, in terms of no adverse impacts and creates efficiency for our staff in engaging with towns, regional planning commissions, et cetera. How many states have a statewide, what you might, well, a statewide standard and then a higher level statewide standard? Do you know? It's a great question. Rebecca Pfeiffer, who was on my team as the state floodplain coordinator, national flood insurance program coordinator, would be able to put a finer point on this. But there are a number of states um, that, my understanding is that for a lot of states, they have certain standards, but it's not a full suite of standards. Um, and it doesn't necessarily supplant, you know, town regulation. They're just layering on certain standards. Um, so I know that Kentucky, I think Kentucky is the closest one, um, but West Virginia, my understanding, just recently adopted higher standards. And so I would have to get back to you or pull Rebecca in to put a finer point on that. Um, Representative Spiel. Yeah. Uh, on your map here, I yeah. see uh, in Southern Vermont, where I'm from, a couple of unorganized gores uh, listed as not participating. I just, I wonder about, um, I just wonder about that uh, and how those places might be protected. Um, but I'm uh, kind of like a sore thumb drawn to the um, kingdom, and I see quite a few towns there. Um, we've had some discussion here about the size of the RPC up there, um, which is, I think, 50 plus towns. Can you talk a little bit about um, what's involved for these towns to um, participate? Yeah, we provide technical assistance to help it enroll towns. I mean, over the last 17 years, we've probably brought in additional 20 towns from when I started back in 2007. So that's that's something we assist with. It, it's up to the town. We can do it. I mean, there's an application and, you know, they have to adopt the maps and get the regulations. Some towns have chosen on purpose to not enroll because if flood insurance isn't available for development in their floodplains, then there's no development in their floodplains. Developers aren't going to go in and, and, and work to meet standards and everything if, uh, if there's no flood insurance availability for those folks. So it can be a tool to limit development. Um, by saying flood insurance isn't available in our regulatory floodplains. Um, so that's a, we want to honor that if towns have made that choice. And I'm not sure if all of those communities um, in your territory have made that choice, but I'll show you in a slide here, they have adopted river corridor regulation. So <laughs> as a, as a, perhaps a proxy for the flood insurance program standards. So I, I also wonder about um, opting out of doing this rather than opting in. Opting out in. Yes. Um, participating rather than opting in? Uh, just choosing to not enroll, period? Well, having to take an action to not, yeah, to not move forward. Well, we have towns that I think, and I think some of those towns in the kingdom are those towns, they have opted to not do anything. Well, I've heard you say that, but I, I think they're just not doing anything as opposed to taking an action oh, to not do anything. They're not, not consciously opting, you're saying. They're not taking an action to opt out, which might... Yeah, I, I, I guess I think what discussion. Representative Sibili is saying is right now they kind of have to opt in. Yes. And you're saying if we, I'm just if wondering we said, about, yeah. what if we said, we're going to do this, in. we're going to do this statewide, but you could opt out. So right now it's town by town. 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's something to consider for right. sure. I, I would bring. I'm okay. just wondering about that, yeah. yeah. There is a representative Smith. Thank you. I can see Derby is, is a participating community. Mm -hmm. And to the right of that on the border is Holland, Charleston, and Brownington, and Orleans, uh, Barton. And it looks like it goes down into like Victory and Granby and that sort of thing. But have these towns had the opportunity to get to become a participating community? And chosen not to. Yes, there was after Irene FEMA pushed us because we received FEMA funding to, to provide technical assistance to towns. There was a push to, for all communities after Irene to, to see if they were willing to join the program, give them the option to opt in. Um, and at that time, a lot of them still chose to stay out. Some of the communities don't have a lot of waterways that, that they have to be concerned about flooding, but. You know, in Derby, we've got we've got one river that runs through town that once in a while it takes a wrong turn. Some of them are riverine class two wetlands that are restricted for development anyway. You know, so sometimes that can be a consideration. That's what I think. Yeah. Um, so shifting to river corridors, here's the lay of the land in terms of the 29 towns that have comprehensive river corridor regulation. Um, what what 213 really gets at, if you look at kind of the zoom in there, those towns in this example surrounding Corinth, is there's a lot of blue lines and stream miles that really aren't looking at riverine erosion and river corridor protection. Now, remember, FEMA maps only cover about 20 percent of our stream miles. And so um, river corridors uh, cover a significantly larger number of those stream miles. Um, and S213 is really the gap that it gets at is what is not being covered by towns because a lot of towns not regulating river corridors and it's sub-jurisdictional under Act 250. So we're not reviewing it under Act 250 because the scale of development isn't large enough. Um, or it's not jurisdictional under our rule because um, our rule only regulates a small subset of activities that towns can't regulate. Representative Celia has a question on that previous slide. Just what's the red? So the red are those mapped river corridors, those larger rivers and streams. And if, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's also kind of a dark green. Those are those small streams, those headwater streams that are draining between a quarter of a square mile and two square miles. Um, 213 isn't going to be regulating those. It would be those red lines, um, those larger rivers and streams. And then the much smaller blue lines you see there, those really small streams draining less than a quarter square mile, those are presumed to be not perennial rivers and streams, but intermittent. River and river corridor, by definition and statute, means it flows perennially all the time. Um, Do you have that mapped already for the state river corridors? Have the river corridors? Yes, mapped. yes something that it's, on, it's online but back to back to my example here it's on our atlas so you can pull up the small streams and the large river corridors and look at it statewide and you can also pull up the streamlines to see where we don't have it tagged and again those are presumed to be intermittent we need some remedial lessons on that we're happy to do, happy to do that maybe the few times Quick, just a quick check in on Act 250 here. You know, we have a procedure that not only guides how we create the map, revise the map, amend the map, but it also lays out our regulatory recommendations to district commissions. It's really awkward. You know, we, we just recommend that district commissions, you know, either permit or not permit or permit with certain conditions. Um, it's a huge, huge um, time suck for the program, to be quite frank. Uh, unlike other, other, unlike other per permitting programs like wetlands or stormwater, we don't have rebuttable permit presumption. One thing that was in an early draft of S-213 on the Senate side was giving us that permit authority for Act 250 jurisdiction. That would free up staff resources immediately. <laughs> um, so I, I, that's something that I would love to see go back into 213. Uh, I know we need a little more on that, if you wouldn't mind yeah. saying that again. Yeah, it's um, S two thirteen originally had it had language in there, and I believe it was like November of this calendar year that if it was Act two fifty jurisdictional, yeah. it was jurisdictional under our rule and just needed a permit from us. 
So instead of us providing recommendations and having developers and consultants kind of litigate the merits of our recommendations all the way up to the Supreme Court over and over again, uh, we'd have tighter kind of control yeah. over whether something moves forward or not. That's not the, to say that our decisions still aren't appealable, but the, the time and effort working mm -hmm. through the Act 250 process, our Office of Planning, <clears throat> it's tremendous. It took a, just on one project in the River Corridor last week, I spent a... <clears throat> inordinate amount of time, um, quite frankly. And so that's something that uh, could be a real near-term boon for the program is to just get clear permitting authority over Act 250 projects. And that, uh, I guess I'm needing the dots connected a little further. So that's, then it would be more like a wetland permit, but you would, would you, wouldn't you, are you engaging at the level of like site design? Is that what's taking time? Yes, it's site design, and it's if we signal to the developer, the consultant, that it, the, the project doesn't meet our regulatory recommendations. You know, it's an encroachment in the river core that can't move forward. It's not meeting the inundation standards. Our procedure aligns with our rule to the regulatory standards. Oftentimes, they say, well, we'll take our chances. We'll go and submit the permit application anyway with our design as is. And we'll just debate the merits of your recommendation in front of the district commission. I see. So the permit would give you more authority. Yes, and it would it, it'd be a it would just be a cleaner engagement that would really free up um, already maxed out staff. I mean, ultimately, years down the road, ideally, I'd like to just decouple from Act 250 altogether, as I think Act 250 can focus on a lot of other important things in a more modernized Act 250. That's my personal opinion. I'll stop there on that. Um, so the last patch in the patchwork, we talked about municipal regulation and Act 250 is our rule, um, which came online in 2015, it was required uh, 2012 session, Act 138. And it regulates these things that we don't allow towns to regulate by statute, um, state-owned buildings and facilities, including VTRANS infrastructure, required agricultural and silvicultural practices, and energy projects that go through the Public Utility Commission. And S213, again, for map river corridors, would amend our rule to cover all development uh, proposals within the map river corridor. Um, so we have an existing rule. We have to engage in rulemaking to amend the rule. Um, but that's what S213 is looking at, is our permit authority um, and expanding that. I'd like to take a little bit of time to just talk about how river corridors are regulated. Um, you know, on paper, it's really simple. You know, along undeveloped reaches like this, our rule says if it's undeveloped, unconfined, unconstrained, new development's prohibited because we want to keep the, that space for the river to adjust over time, to be least erosive, maximize floodplain function, et cetera. But the reality is, and okay, it goes back to my Act 250 example, but it happens at the local level for towns that are administering river corridor regulations. It happens through our rule. That doesn't mean no turns people away. A lot of people will modify their proposal, cite it outside the river corridor, but we are challenged often and frequently um, about the accuracy of our map. Um, and, and that is also a time consuming process. We have a procedure that allows people to submit better data to us. I mean, we, we, we stand firm that the river corridor map should reflect best available data. And if you've got data that shows that we've got the map wrong, we will consider that. And if we agree with it, we'll amend the map. And usually what developers are looking for is for us to shrink the river corridor. Sometimes we do. Oftentimes we say, thanks for the new okay. data. <laughs> Actually, the river's more sensitive and it's wider. Um, so the answer is still no after a lot of back and forth. At the same time, we owe project proponents due process to, to challenge the map. And when it, comes to, to, when it comes to the 213 work and expanding you know, the, the universe of projects we have to review, we really need to, as part of the education and outreach and the infill mapping, which I'll talk about, we really need to beef up our map amendment and revision language. We need to do significant education and outreach to consultants so they know, you know what an effective map challenge entails, what it means, what the costs are. Um, and 
really with the goal, ultimately, if we do a good job of minimizing frivolous map challenges, because we get a lot of frivolous map challenges and it takes a lot of staff time. So, so we uh, just follow up on that. Sure. Um, you're getting map challenges on the, 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 the few areas where you have this rule in effect, mostly, or in the towns that have adopted it's through all jurisdictions. It's either, it can be a town project where a town has adopted river corridors and that's the primary jurisdiction. Somebody's challenging it at that level when we're, we provide the technical assistance to the town with respect to that. It can be through Act 250 if that's the jurisdiction or through our rule. And sometimes there's overlap, right? Sometimes you need a local permit and the Act 250 permit. Sometimes if it's a state building, you need this state permit, and it might be Act 250 jurisdictional, like the Waterbury Office Complex was after I read. Um, and this isn't perhaps, a, this example shows kind of a dynamic reach of river that's meandering significantly, but we also have a lot of reaches of river that are still straight and trying to meander. And it's in those instances where somebody will say, well, gee, the river hasn't really moved that much in 40 years. I should be able to build here. Well, as we learned from last year's flood, and just about every flood, a river can be stable until it's not, and then it catastrophically can move 70 feet in one event. And so um, it, oftentimes it's those situations where the river's been straightened, pushed up against the valley wall. It looks way over there. Why can't I develop in the river corridor? It's like, well, it's over there now. Doesn't mean it will be next flood, next year, next decade. When you say a lot, how many in a year? Map challenges? A dozen across the three jurisdictions. And that's at different levels, you know, um, but the most significant are the ones where we, a lot of iterative back and forth with consultants and then them moving forward with, you know, challenging it through Act 250 and elevating it to the courts, et cetera. Something representative Thank you. Thank you. Out of the dozen that you get map challenges, how many of them would you call frivolous? That's a great question because a lot of oftentimes we do change the map. Are the 5,600 miles of, of mapped river corridor that was updated with our detailed field data covering almost 3,000 miles of, of river. So there's a couple thousand miles of river that are based on not detailed data. And so we get, and that's one thing we do is. We give folks the benefit of the doubt, especially in those cases where we don't have detailed data. We go out there and go, oh, geez, we got it wrong. In that case, we'll change the map. There's not a big, it's not a big deal. Oftentimes we'll see, you know, features, be it bedrock or other elements that result in us modifying the map. I'd say half of frivolous. Yeah. Um, and the, okay, here's the point I'm getting at. Half of those are frivolous map challenges. In your opinion, or in the people that are challenging you? Also a good question. In my opinion, just given the tremendous amount of time that at the end doesn't change the outcome in terms of our determination, it's still in the river corridor. You didn't make a good case. You didn't provide the data we told you we needed to evaluate, the, not just the data, but the analysis of that data to say, oh, geez, the river is of a different sensitivity and the river corridor should be different. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. I think you'd get a different answer if you had a consultant in the hot seat right now. Probably get a different answer if I asked the people that were doing the map challenges too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, and I, again, back to the education outreach, we want everybody to fully appreciate what we're embarking on before we start issuing permits. No surprises. This is what's coming. This is how it works. We want to take a lot of constructive criticism to do this right because it's a big deal. Um, so going from the opposite end of the continuum, you know, generally we start with no, it's prohibited along undeveloped reaches. Um, we do allow development to take place within river corridors. Um, we have specific provisions in our rule, in model bylaws, in our Act 250 procedure to allow infill in densely developed areas. The idea is, this is Barry City, significant investment and in public infrastructure. We're not letting the Stevens branch run wild at least not in the near future, <laughs> with all that investment through the river valley. We're, we're committed to keeping that river locked in place. Additional infill or development in the river corridor here doesn't exacerbate the river instability um, by way of channelizing the river to protect new development. 
there's still flood hazard here. Most of the river bottoms, FEMA floodplain, you still need to meet those elevation inundation standards to, to mitigate and harden buildings against that. But again, public interest in managing the river to protect investments and not just private investments, but a, a real key test is public investments, water infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, buried energy infrastructure. Um, and then we also kind of, again, betwixt and between the very densely developed areas like Montpelier or a Berry City or a Springfield and the undeveloped reaches of river, we have a lot of piecemeal spot development, um, like that's shown here, where you'll have a few houses or a business or a facility that's in the river corridor, it's there, um, it can continue to be there, and we allow modifications, minor modifications to existing structures, as long as it's not any closer to the river. We call it the shadowing provision. You see that big building there, you know, they want to put an addition or an accessory structure that's not any closer to the river. That doesn't make things worse. You know, again, if, if the, the owner of that building came into my river engineer and said, the river's getting close to my building, I need to rock the bank to protect it, we would issue them a permit to rock the bank to protect it. There's already a commitment there by way of the existing investment um to to protect that investment so we do allow small modifications to pre-existing development we don't want to condemn existing uses we've really gone out of our way to try to be sensitive to that and getting more feedback as we go forward on that um is going to be important what, can I, what is your process for supporting towns in making these decisions about re rebuilding for example <clears throat> montpelier or barry right now making you know are you helping move toward a benefit cost analysis or an understanding of, um, you know, like the previous method, you, we're not going to let the Stevens branch run wild, but what if the Stevens branch keeps running wild? And when do we say we actually need to let it run wild? Yeah, no, that's a great... We decide, and how do you help us? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we're in great, we're, we're engaged in kind of multiple dimensions there. There's the regulatory side. I mean, towns, if they're rebuilding, they have to meet their regs. And so if they want to rebuild, sometimes you can't just put back what was there. You need to elevate and flood proof because the building is substantially damaged. We're going to have to do that for our own state buildings here in Montpelier. Um, same thing. So there's a conversation around if you're going to rebuild and you want to rebuild, there's meeting those regulatory requirements. But we have a lot of mitigation money and there's opportunity here for buyouts. So there's also to mitigate those buildings to stay in place. But those conversations about retreating are happening. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big Vermont Emergency Management Initiative hiring consultants to look at multiple communities around the state and multiple watersheds to get at what you just described. Let's target areas for restoration, for mitigation, for retreat. At the same time, that's a conversation that we have to have with partners, right? You know, we, don't, we don't impose that on the towns. They have to want to do it. And so it's really providing that technical assistance to try to think through that. So that's something we do after floods big and small. Um, my team does. So um, again, thinking about infill and S213, that's a significant front-loaded effort of is mapping infill areas. This is a simple, just conceptual um, infill area that I just kind of drew on the fly just for kind of visual purposes, but, you know, again, the idea is that it memorializes what we already have in our rule and procedure, which is allowing it to happen, but it memorializes it on the map. But a lot of people, you, you ask them on the street, they're going to still say, River Corridor doesn't allow you to do anything anywhere. That's not true. This memorializes that in certain landscape context and development pattern, River Corridor regulation doesn't apply. And so having these green zones will help with planners, towns, it would, quite frankly, if we had these around the state, make our work today more efficient. Because absent these, we still drill down and go, oh, is infill appropriate here? Is it not? It takes time. Um, not every town's going to be qualified. But, you know, again, we, it's, a, it's really an important thing to do before we expand regulation. I think it helps everybody out. Um, and again, same thing, heavily managed to protect existing investments in this situation. We've already channelized the river to protect what's there. New development in the river corridor does not add more channelization. I want to pause here. How are we doing on time? 
Good. Okay. Um, I want to hit on something because I, I did catch part of, of Michael Brady's uh, intro to the bill last week, and he brought up the, the FEMA National Flood Insurance Program definition of development, which is all encompassing, right? You know, any human made change to improve or unimproved real estate, blah, 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 is the trigger for flood hazard areas. And we do have that in our rule, and that needs to stay in our rule because through our rule, we do regulate for those things that towns can't regulate, flood hazard areas. So for us to stay compliant with the flood insurance program, we need to keep that definition in there. A couple of points I wanna make though, is while that definition is a trigger for review, if you're outside of the FEMA flood hazard area, again, favorite reach of river here on the Browns River, if you're outside of the FEMA flood hazard area and you're in the river corridor, we don't apply FEMA standards to river corridor development. River corridor development, because of the meandering nature of, and, and trying to deal with and acknowledge that, it's an in or out. Can the development go safely in? Yes or no. Um, will the development, if it can go in safely, cause more channelization and cause more instability? Yes or no. So it's an in and out determination. Um, you're either in or you're out. But, but say that again, I think it's really important. Sure. You're, what I think I'm hearing you saying is that the definition of development will be different in the FEMA mapped area versus the river corridor area. Right now it's the same, but Under with, the with rulemaking going forward, we'll have the, and getting feedback from, from communities, stakeholders, I think it's, I'm happy to entertain a unique definition of development or trigger for something that's just solely within the river corridor. But it's not causing problems now, because again, as I'll, I'll show you through our general permit, we allow and enable lots of low risk things to still happen in river corridors, as long as they're not you know, significant permanent human investments. Um, and there are exceptions, so. so when you say right now it's the same, do you mean right now in S213, the way it's drafted, not right now, right now they're different in the world? Of Good, great question. When I say right now, I'm talking about our existing rule. So when we're administering our existing rule for development proposals, the trigger for development is that NFIP definition, whether it's in the FEMA flood hazard area, the river corridor, or both. That <laughs> triggers the review that, oh, a permit's required. Okay, that's not right? But that's now. But in the future, <clears throat> part of the development of, of uh, an amended rule, if S213 becomes law, it's, um, it's more than a fair ask to consider a unique trigger if you're just <clears throat> the river If that provides clarity to folks and it also provides, you know, administrative efficiency, um, that's, that's fair to consider. Would it be more efficient? To be determined. Yeah. I don't know. Again, I don't see it as posing a problem. Maybe if I move on, I, I think that the then get to your question. No, it's that it, yeah, it's can, not really simple, but it was that you're either in or you're out. I don't actually know what that means. I think you're either in the FEMA mapped area or not, or no, this is a great question, or, or not. Yeah. Okay. In terms of whether something can go in the river port, so again, somebody wants to build in that yellow area on the map there, outside of the FEMA mapped flood hazard area. The current definition, if you want to do something there, is whatever it is you want to do, given how broad that definition is, it triggers a permit requirement. But in terms of the regulatory standard for that development, there isn't really a set of standards per se, like you need to build it this way to be safe from erosion. We don't want it in there. So we, the, the, the determination we make, a permitting determination we make, isn't, doesn't meet standards. It's can the development be allowed in a river corridor or can it? We can either permit it or we can't. Because again, if you think about erosion and the only real mitigation action, if you put an investment there is to bank, to rock the banks of the river, to lock it in place. We don't want to do more of that. We have enough of that already statewide. So it's, it's you know, it's either permittable or, if it, or it's not. It's kind of a simple binary determination about for permitting. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Those are great questions. I know it's, I know this is nuanced and complicated. And, is that the current uh, floodplain or is that the proposed floodplain? That is uh, the red area. The, the, gray, the gray area. The green. That's the river corridor. That's the, that is that's the, the existing. That's the existing river corridor, Browns River, Underhill, Jericho. Oh. 
I'm not regulated. Carbonate <laughs> <laughs> of sacola. So I'm I think I'm mostly following what you're saying. But that's good. But it's but it's but it feels very abstract. And I think it would it would help me at least if maybe you could walk through some of the ideas you just went over but with a couple of specific examples that would might even if they're imaginary examples, but like something which feels more practical that would maybe elucidate some of what you're trying to say. Sure, I think maybe going back to this example, <clears throat> I think, right? Um, I'll turn my pointer on, I can find it. So again, we have provisions to shadow behind existing development because it's there, right? So we could issue a yes, Yes, it can go in there. If for whatever reason, they couldn't cite it outside. That's always the conversation we have. Is there, can you locate it outside the meander belt of the river? That's, um, so there are provisions there, but you look downstream where it's completely undeveloped down here, downstream, where I've got my pointer. The first look at that is we say, no, we, we would prohibit a new home going in there. And this is where the map challenge goes in. I don't think the map is right. Well, you might be right. Do we have data there? Oh, we don't have data there. Let's get a river scientist out there. Oh, there's a huge mound of bedrock that's clear. It's going to confine that lateral migration. We can amend the map. Your house can go in. Absent something like that or other data to show that this river corridor shouldn't be as wide as it is, if you're in an undeveloped reach, the initial answer is no. And then if I, again, an example back to Montpelier zooming in, um, or maybe Barry City's better here. Um, with that level of encroachment there, it can go in. You're not exacerbating erosion risk there, and we are committed to keeping the river locked in place. Again, there's FEMA standards that town would require you to, to elevate and flood proof and all of that. So not all hazard area regulation goes out the door, but with the river corridor consideration in this context, we'd say it can go in. It's a, this would be one of those green infill areas if we had it mapped already, right? Does that help? Um, well, it, just, it, it, it seemed like you were talking about these examples in a particular context of the bill, how things versus how things are now, and and how so how the bill would, would change your process, making it potentially easier in some ways, but or maybe or maybe more difficult but more protective at the same time um, in other cases. So that's I think that's more where. Yeah. I quite see. yeah, and I apologize for adding confusion there. Again, I, I wanted to address, because I do think some people are concerned that we're going to be applying for developments solely in the river corridor outside the flood hazard area. We're going to be applying flood inundation regulatory standards like we would in the flood hazard area because of that national flood insurance program definition that we have in our rule. I just wanted to provide some clarity that that is not the case now, nor going forward, because again, it's a simpler permit test or determination in terms of whether the structure can go in there. Um, I think what I'd be happy to do is I could come back with some more tangible examples of walking through something. I do want to get through the rest of my slide deck, but I also want to make sure you guys have clarity there. So um, I'd be happy to come back and do a longer form walkthrough um, if you think that's in order. Because again, I want you guys, I want all your questions answered and I want you to understand this stuff because it's uh, a lot to it. Um, um, Michael Grady also mentioned the general permit. And I think that's also important here because again, it's a tool that allows us to permit efficiently and it allows us to, you know, again, we don't prohibit every single thing in the river code or big permanent things, big permanent encroachments, but we allow a lot of lower risk activities. Um, uh, I, there's a link in the slide deck here and it's too much to run through. I encourage you to look at our general permit, but it allows farming activities. It allows repair and replacement of existing infrastructure and other investments um, it even has for certain types of development that have to cross our river valleys, like transportation and energy infrastructure, linear transportation even has a no practicable alternative when you can't avoid it. And so there are provisions in the general permit and our rule that allow things to move forward. So 
again, I, I expect that we'll have to update this as well as part of the rulemaking update if this moves forward. Um, and we, I'd expect that we'd add additional provisions and activities in our general permit based on feedback from, from Vermonters. Question? Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, is there a cost to the permits? You know, there is. Something all it is. Yeah, there is. Um, if general, well, there's non-reporting stuff. So we have non-reporting category where as long as it's this type of development and you adhere to the provisions in our general permit, you don't even need to tell us about it. There's not a permit fee. Um, if, if some of the reporting stuff that requires an application under the general permit requires a fee, don't quote me on this. I want to say it's $200 permit application fee, individual permit where we're looking at map challenges or detailed modeling for, for flood hazard areas. Um, that can, I believe that's a $350 permit fee. Those fees have been flat since 2017, but, but we do have a fee structure. And I think that's a good question. Not in bond arts. How, how does the bill change what we've just been talking about? That's one thing I've had a hard time following this point of what yeah. I'm talking about now or what I'm talking about going forward. And for instance, with the general permit and in an area with a fair amount of development you know, already in a yeah. corridor. Yeah, it's a great. What is required now for um, an addition on a house or something as simple as a garden shed versus what would happen after those passed? Some of that is to be determined based on input. You know, again, that's why the education outreach is really key before we open up the hood and amend the rule, because some of that, I don't want to prejudge what will stay the same or what should change. I think the key thing, based on what we know right now, is, again, our current rule, which would be amended, just regulates those things towns can't regulate. State buildings and facilities, ag and forestry, and public utility commission projects. What it adds to our rule in terms of river corridors for all development, not just those municipally exempt. So not flood hazard areas, towns are still largely going to be regulating those, but it adds river corridor regulation for all types of development. And again, right now, the trigger, until we amend the rule uh, to consider perhaps a different trigger, is that FEMA definition of development. So if you're going in and making changes, you're filling, you're grading, you're building, um, you're putting something permanent in there, uh, then that triggers a review. Does that help? Uh, and what is the, with, within that context, what is the, what, when does the general permit come into play in that? And what does that actually mean in terms of what it takes to get a permit? Uh, the general permit, you know, again, we have it now, we're going to keep it. I think I would expect us to, to, to build it out further in consideration of all development. Um, again, I, you, there could be some other types of low risk development that we might add there that could be in a non-reporting category or get a registration, which is a very kind of quick, easy permit issuance. So I would imagine we might layer some additional activities in there, but again, I don't know what those are today. I wanna, I wanna hear from Vermonters about what those activities What's appropriate as a low risk activity? So. Representative Sibelia. So uh, you have mentioned several times a commitment to uh, looking at Barry, uh, commitment to uh, keeping the river locked in its banks uh, in some places. And my question is where do we have those commitments and what is the um, structure of that commitment? Well, it, it's really simply that, again, we don't condemn existing uses, right? So I'll just use an example. I'll use a state. So it's where, let me just see if I can short circuit and demonstrate maybe some small understanding. So places where we've already developed the river corridor? Yes. Yes. I mean, and I guess a great example of that is the hundreds of permits my engineers issued after the flooding and people needed to armor the stream bank to protect their house from falling in the river. Now we allow them to do that. So the investment in the river corridor means we're, you know, again, allowing people to protect their investment. And of course, that's a whole nother scale when you're talking a downtown Montpelier or Springfield or something. Like that. And those are the green zones you were talking about that this bill would also enable. Yes, yes. So um, just, uh, I'm finishing here on, on resources. Um, and so this is the org chart of my program. 
Um, I want to appreciate kind of where we are today and what how 213 could impact this and what we've asked for um, going forward if 213 moves forward. Um, notice that we have three vacancies right now in my program. Um, the good news is they're open for recruitment, so we're working to fill those positions. How long have they been vacant? Um, two of them for just a few months, but the river scientist position under the physical science section there has been vacant for 15 months. Um, and that, then that was a, that was a, that was a person that left a very senior person that left due to burnout. Um, and when we think about 213, it's really these two sections that are both going to be, um, helping with the development and the implementation of 213, Rebecca Pfeiffer's team, um, of our regional floodplain managers, they support the patchwork of regulatory jurisdictions, towns, Act 250, um, and our rule. And then our physical scientists are really key in supporting that too, in terms of river corridor regulatory work, the map challenges, amending the map with better data. Um, one thing that's really noteworthy I wanna point out here is you'll notice kind of an unevenness in staffing there. After Irene, we asked, for Act 138, we asked for six positions to support Act 138 implementation. We got the two engineers, we got the two floodplain managers. We didn't get the two river scientists we asked for, and we are still feeling that pain as of today, and as of losing that, that senior position to burnout 15 months ago. So it is critical that we have river science support if we're gonna expand our river corridor. Um, the other thing I wanna point out here is Highlighted in yellow there, myself, Rebecca Pfeiffer, Stacey Pomo, it's really gonna be senior expert staff that are gonna be involved in building this out um, ahead of implementation. And it will take time to free us up. Um, we are completely steeped in flood recovery work, whether it be to the flood recovery office, Vermont Emergency Management, communities. Um, so, it's going to be a challenge if we have new marching orders on July 1. We're not going to be able to just simply pivot and start implementing. We're, we're going to be training new staff. We might have new staff to hire. Um, so I want to bring you to the timeline that Secretary Moore offered in Senator Bray's committee back in January. Um, these are her slides that I'm just reposting here. Um, we recommended a longer time horizon. 213 has a three and a half year time horizon. We recommended six years to phase this. And while that seems like a long time, it's also a lot of work contemplated and we think to do it right, to set, a, set the program up for success and to be transparent about what we're doing, um, we think we need more time um, to do that. Here's another look at that same timeline. So I'd really encourage the committee to think about that timeline relative to what is in there. Um, right now, my biggest concern, and I'll show you a little, put, pin this down a little bit more here. My biggest concern, you know, due to existing pressures, concerns with flood recovery work is that, you know, we're coming back multiple times over a three and a half year period to say we can't meet those targets. And that's, I'd rather not be in that position. So that's my fear. Um, these are the resources attached to the six-year timeline. These are the resources we asked for. So two for the flood hazard area minimum standards piece, two for the river corridor infill mapping, education outreach, rule development, including general permit update, mapping procedure update, et cetera. So four at, out of the gates. Um, and then potentially, potentially three to four to implement the expanded permitting jurisdiction. Those could come online later if we had the six year timeline. Since 213 has the three and a half year timeline, we asked for all of these up front at once. So that's what was in 213 for Senate appropriations stripped everything out. And then lastly here, last slide, um, this is a kind of just a personal internal, very coarse resolution draft work product, but I hope as a visual, it helps kind of crystallize what I'm worried about <laughs> uh, in the near term, given the three and a half year timeline and the resource question. This is a, you know, again, a drafty six month chunk of time Gantt chart that I built out looking at all the elements that we'll be responsible for. Um, in orange, primarily there. Uh, I guess I'll, the one thing I will start with is if you look at those blue cells there, river corridor infill mapping is this first line 
um, there is there is a jump start on that. We we did some pilot internal pilot work with ACCD a number of years back, pre COVID, right before COVID lockdown, with a number of communities, just internal to kind of get our heads around what that might look like. Um, Lauren Oates at the Nature Conservancy, as I understand it, last fall um, put in place or a contract. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but a contract. Um, for a consultant to take that initial pilot work and try to advance it along. So that's good. Um, that will be very helpful in moving things along in that regard. Um, at the same time, there's a kind of a stop and end point where partners can help and where we really have to pick up in terms of updating our procedure and definitely have to be front and center in terms of the education and outreach and, and all of that stuff. The other piece here um, is with, with respect to the River Corridor education and outreach. We have signals from partners that are going to be willing to help out of the gates. I believe Chris Campany, perhaps other, a couple other RPCs might be willing with the resources they have to try to help jumpstart that quickly. Um, but again, uh, that will still require our participation ultimately, right? They can't do it on their own, but we, we believe we have partners in getting some of that going. Um, the thing I want to point you to, though, is the very top of the list here is assumed, even though I have bill section in there right now, is non-applicable, is hiring and training new staff, hiring consultants. That's at least in, if July 1, if we have authorization for new positions, that's at least an 18-month lag before our capacity is really freed up. It's a really tough hiring climate right now. Um, you know, the, the floodplain manager position we're recruiting for, we only got two applicants. Um, oftentimes we're underwhelmed sometimes with the two or three applicants and we have to go back out and post for much longer periods. Sometimes after interviews, we're underwhelmed and we have to go back out and post. It's a tough, at all levels, you know, more senior positions, line staff, in between positions. It's a hard hiring climate. Um, and it also, you know, there's also just the bureaucratic friction <laughs> of paperwork and hiring and all of that stuff that takes time. So the reality is, you know, even if we're given resources, you know, there's going to be slippage in timeline. Not everything is going to slip uniformly and all at once, but um, three and a half years is a lot to get these 17 things done. And again, once this needs to be, if this needs to be built out in more detail in quarterly fashion, um, I suspect that there are subcategories here and it's going to be more than 17 things we have to do. We don't have that last slide. It would be very helpful if we could get it. As long as there's a cat, I, I need to attach a ca big caveat to it because again, it's it's it was just me trying to get my head around like what is all this work that potentially is coming and what's it look like. It would it would help us do the same thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That. Um, and I guess I'm curious the six um, FTEs that you have requested with a six year timeline on the last slide I have. Um, what are those positions? I mean, it strikes me there's a lot of rulemaking that would happen here, and is there and, and there's overlap with the other sections of the bill. And I'm wondering if there's been any coordination amongst uh, folks across the departments, or not really departments, whatever your subcategory is for the dams um, portion of this and your portion of it and the wetlands portion of it. To say like, oh, we could, we need one new attorney to help us rulemaking. We need something more consolidated. Yeah, I mean, this is uniquely just pro. At least as far as I understand it, maybe you now Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's program staff. And back to the kind of this slide here, you know, it's really these positions are going to be base positions to do our base work because they don't have the expertise and program knowledge to develop and move this along. It's really to free up my time, Rebecca's time, Stacy's time, maybe our GIS specialist time at some point. So a lot of it's doing our base work, supporting river science, mapping, the three jurisdictions of regulation that we have to support every day. And so the, these new positions are to free up senior staff time. They're not gonna be doing the development work. Um, the difference is, though, is the positions in that last row there, that's not for the development work. That's at such time we're beginning to issue permits under an a, a expanded rule. Once the rule goes into effect, we expect to, to need more positions 
for both permitting, supporting map challenges and updates, stuff like that. And also we have a different slide. Uh, versus two FTEs in the final. Um... Oh, that's because I made a mistake in as I was developing these. And so, so this is the number. You know, I, I, I'm aligning with what, this is essentially what we asked for on the Senate side. Um, and what was in the bill again. So this aligns with what was in the bill before appropriations stripped out the positions. Um, so that was a mistake on mine. So I will send Will an updated slide deck for oh. the record. Representative Bongar. Um, going back to the slide with the positions, like showing the vacancy for John Luca Campbell's the org chart here. Yeah, yeah just yeah. Um, those two columns on the left, um, when we have meetings, we often have John, who's no longer there, but John and Josh both show up. Is it possible to combine those jobs because they look, and maybe this is this is not realistic, but the um, the river corridor and floodplain protection is kind of similar, do you think, in skill set to river management? But I'm um, and so I'm just wondering whether it would make any sense to develop those skill sets and have rather than every time I have a meeting having both John and Josh come, one of them come. Yeah. Is that so it's so a, it's a fair do it for a reason, but I just want to Yeah, no, it's a it's a fair question. The short answer is no. Um, the engineers uniquely administer our stream alteration rule regulatory program. That's permitting activities in the channel, dredging, filling. Um, you know, it's a lot of work around transportation infrastructure, bank armoring, things like that. And they are overwhelmed still. Um, and, and, and then on Rebecca Pfeiffer's team there on the far left, she's not working, they're not looking at the regulatory work within the channel. Although sometimes it's triggered, it's it's uh, it's the river corridor from the floodplain stuff, and that's a bear unto itself. So to make regulatory generalists with these very technical programs would be difficult at best. So that's really the answer: is there's some yeah. technical that you need to know very yes. yes. specific skill set. Yes. And if you try to make that skill set get too broad, yes, it'll be hard for one person to have a good handle on the entirety of that skill set. We have had internal conversations over the years about whether that makes sense or not. We always land on, no, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but that's a, again, fair question. Thank you for asking. Thank you for your testimony. Great, thank you, appreciate it. We're going to take a five minute break. <laughs> 